Aloete Omnes. Welcome to my talk and Callum's talk on musicians and their instruments in the Greco-Roman world. I'm April and that's Callum. All right, so the, <laughs> the first instrument we're going to start with is the tibia. Now in Greek it's called the aulos and what that was was an instrument that had two pipes uh, made of either bone or boxwood or cane and you would insert uh, a double reed into the receiver end of each one. So it's kind of sorta, but not really like playing two oboes at the same time. Um, they actually, in addition to being made from bone or boxwood or cane could also be encased with metal. The pipe itself, the resonating pipe was called the bombix and the reeds were usually referred to as arundo in Latin or kalamos in Greek. So here we can see some pictures. Here's someone playing and note their special carrying case. Uh, and here's some more people playing. And you'll note that this is clearly a child or a teenager playing because he's much shorter than the other people. Uh, here's a woman playing. And here's even a special type of aulos called the Phrygian aulos or Phrygian tibia. Uh, and it notice has a horn on the bottom of it. All right, so in mythology, the inventor of the double pipes is Minerva. So she finds the cane, she makes the instrument, and she starts playing, according to the story. And she's loving it, and she goes up to Mount Olympus, and she's showing off, and then she hears the mocking of the other goddesses. And they're all like, you ugly when you're doing that. Your cheeks are all puffed out, and your face is kind of turning blue. So you're very ugly. And she's like, I don't care. I ain't listening to you. And so she left the party and she just kept on piping. But then she came to a pond and she saw her reflection in the pond. And she was like, oh my, oh, I am not looking good. They really were right. My face is all puffed out from my, my cheeks and my face is kind of blue. And so she cast them down for making her look ugly. And she cursed it so that whoever picked up next, they would pay a price for it. So along comes Marcius. Marcius is a satyr, you know, one of those half men, half goat, and they're the companions of the god Bacchus or Dionysus. So he comes along and he finds the double pipes and he starts uh, playing them. He's like, oh man, this is so cool. And he practices and he practices and he gets really good at them until one day Athena's curse kicks in and he gets such a big head, he challenges Apollo to a music contest. He's like, basically, Apollo, I can outplay you on my pipe. And Apollo's like, what now? Hmm, I don't think so. So they have their contest, but in advance, Apollo says and gets Marcius to agree that the winner can do whatever he wants to the loser. And Marcius, because he's gotten a big head from playing because uh, of Minerva's curse, he actually agrees to that. Just as a note, never agree to those kinds of conditions. Just keep that in mind. So they play and at first looks like Marcius is gonna be declared the winner, but suddenly, Apollo flips over his liar and he's like, can you do this? Uh, and he plays and continues to sing. And of course, Marcius cannot do that with a double pipe. You cannot play them upside down. And he loses and the punishment, they flay him and turn his skin into a wine sack. So it doesn't go too well for him, but Pliny the Elder, however, actually says it was actually Marcius who invented it in the first place. And he just eliminates uh, Athena entirely. So tragic story, but cool instrument. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to Callum to talk about free, how you make the reeds to play this instrument, starting now. Thank you very much, April. So, um, uh, Aulos reeds are made of cane. Um, a cane is a weed that grows wild all across Europe and in many places in uh, the Americas too. Um, 
there are two types of cane we can use to make Aulus reeds. Uh, the first is a Rundo Donax, uh, but the more likely contender for the type of reed they used uh, uh, to make Aulus reeds in, in antiquity was uh, Phragmites. Um, uh, so the way we make the uh, the reeds is we start with a piece of cane like the one you see in the picture um, and you normally cut the plant uh, into sections and then you let it season for two years and the result ends up looking a bit like this. So uh, here is our cartoon version of the piece of cane. The first thing we do is we cut the cane in, in two like this and uh, the part where it splits on each side, that's going to be the tips of, uh, of, of the two reeds that go into uh, both the pipes. So uh, the way we form the reeds uh, is we, first of all, uh, we, take, we want to take the piece of cane and we want to strip off all the bark. And when we strip the, uh, the cane off the bark, we end up uh, with it looking like this so it loses its shiny color and as you can see we end up uh, looking at the strata of the cane uh, below it that's going to form the outer surface of the reed then what we want to do is we want to make uh, make the cane go from this shape into this shape so we want to form this uh, sort of waist uh, in the middle of the reed so the way we do that is we uh, take our piece of cane and we take a pot of boiling water then what we do is we throw the piece of cane into the pot of boiling water and we let it heat for uh, several seconds. And what this does is it makes the cane go very soft. Um, then we take our piece of cane and we wrap a cord around it and we attach one end of the cord to something solid uh, like a kitchen table or a clamp or something. And we attach the other end of the cord to our belt um, and we put the piece, we wrap the the cord around the piece of cane as you can see in this diagram and then what we do is we lean back uh, on the cord which is attached to our belt and uh, as we do so we roll the cane between our fingers and ever so gradually we end up uh, making this shape and then what we do in order to keep it in that shape so when we release the pressure of the cord um, uh, we, can, we can keep this shape we uh, put some binding around it some string and that, that, that way we create this shape. Um, so that's how we get this shape. Then what we want to do is we want to uh, form, uh, uh, form the reed into this shape. Uh, so the last part of the process um, is we take our newly formed piece of cane and we again throw it back into the boiling water and we let it uh, sizzle away for a, a few seconds. And then uh, we take the piece of cane out of the boiling water and then between our fingers, we sort of squish the tip of the reed and form it into this shape. It's a bit like crushing the end of a drinking straw. Um, then we clamp the reed so to hold it shut and we leave it. I tend to leave my reeds for two or three weeks just to find that shape. And then we can start to refine the reeds by uh, scraping it and uh, gradually blowing the reed in in order that it works. Um, and now I'm going to pass you back to April uh, so uh, we can continue the story. All right. Thank you. All right. So who played the tibia or the alus in the ancient world? Well, in Latin, the male players are called the tibiken or tibikines, plural. And in Greek, they were called aletas or aletas, plural. Uh, the female version, and yes, there were women who played, uh, are tibikini or and aletricais. Um, we know that adults and children played the double pipe. Um, we also know from inscriptions that there were other terms besides tibican and uh, elatrix. Uh, you had chorales, with, who was specifically a double piper who accompanied a chorus, which is one of the main uses. Um, you had protales, who is the chief double piper. You had hupales, who is an accompanist of some kind and the Musicarius, who's also an accompanist, uh, double piper. On the female end, you had a special class of double pipers called Amubaya, which we think was a Syrian uh, female double piper, or in the female version of Corallus as well, Corala, who's the female double piper who accompanied the chorus. 
So as far as their social class goes, we know that a lot of the Pipers were slaves or freedmen and freed women. This was not something that was done just by rich people. This was done from the slaves all the way up to rich people. So all social classes. We know that some of them are very, very young. We know they took a lot of pride in their art and that they took part in both formal and informal competitions. And some of them through this competition circuit um, became superstars and accrued lots of wealth and status. We also know that they were part of guilds um, called collegia in Latin. And in fact, po quite possibly the earliest labor strike in recorded Western history is actually by the double pipers when their uh, privileges got taken away. Spoiler, they got their privileges back. Right. So how do we know for sure that people from all classes and whatnot took place? Well, we have graffiti and we have sepulchral inscriptions that tell us this. So this one, uh, graffito from Pompeii, is actually really cool because it's one of the only things we have that we know for sure was written by a woman. Uh, that is one of the only writings from in Latin from the ancient world that was written by a woman and in a woman's hand, for sure. All right, and apparently she was a young Tibikina who had took part in some sort of music contest, the Pont Organa. Uh, speculation isn't quite sure what that is, but seems like it might have been a contest for multiple instruments, kind of like a talent show contest. Um, and she lost. She lost to the lyre player and singer, and she was not happy about that. So at the end of this little graffito, she says, Balkanus, that is fire is the cure, whether she means to throw her instrument in there since she lost or the winner's instrument in there because he lost, or maybe they just destroy everything altogether. Hard to say, but she was clearly not a happy camper. All right. And sometimes I imagine when I see this particular little shard of pot and her looking at that and going, hmm, what's going on with my pipes? I should have won, man. All right. We also, like I said, had some sepulchral inscriptions. The one on the left is a young freed woman named Fulvia Capiola, and she tells us she there she's a Tibikina. That's on her tombstone, so she's very proud of that. But she died just 15 years of age. So it's very sad. But at the same time, it tells us that people y'all's age definitely were playing the double pipes, and in order to be a Tibikina by age 15, she probably started when she was much younger. Uh, on the right, we see just Lucius Oxius Daphnus, another Corallus. We don't know anything else about him, not how old he was when he died or anything else. The only thing they felt like putting on his tombstone was his name and the fact that he's a double piper, which shows his pride in this. All right, and one more. This one says, to the blessed spirits of Calochiris, he's a homeborn slave, Verna, uh, very sweet, and a genius accompanist, uh, that's Ingenio Sissimo, who lived 15 years. So again, he was a teenager and a very talented teenage musician who died young, and his fellow slave Daphnis made this for him well-deserving. All right, so what did they play for with the double pipes? They played for funerals, they played for theater, every single tragedy, comedy, pantomime were all accompanied by the double pipes. Start thinking about when you think about tragedies, they're all musicals, which has a little different sense for us, but they were all musicals in the ancient world. They played for all the sacrifices and they played for the symposium or the convivium, you know, the dinner parties that were really important in Greek and Roman culture and they played any time they would have choruses. So they would play for that too. So question now becomes, ah. Well, what did the alloy sound like? Um, so many people uh, around Europe and the States and the world in general have been working on the, this problem for a few years now and uh, uh, we've uh, reconstructed some alloy um, and the first one I want to show with you is uh, an instrument that uh, is made by 
friend of mine called Robin Howe in Canada. And uh, this is a reconstruction based off of two surviving Auloi, the Megara and uh, the Megara Aulos and the Elgin Aulos. The Elgin Aulos is in the British Museum and the Megara Aulos is in uh, Megara in Greece. And the Elgin, uh, this, is, this instrument incorporates the bore dimensions uh, and uh, finger hole placements of the Elgin Aulos and the, with the uh, extension keys, uh, which you find uh, a similar style of extension key that you find on the Megara Aulos. Um, and uh, the picture uh, below uh, shows you that. So the, uh, the instrument in Megara has uh, these long sliding keys uh, that you can see uh, uh, on the instrument and they slide uh, up and down rather than, uh, sorry, from side to side rather than up and down like you would find on a modern clarinet or bassoon. Um, and uh, it sounds a bit like this. Um, let's see if we can... The instrument has large finger holes, um, which allows you to slide uh, easily and play all the microtones that uh, you find in ancient Greek scales. So the second Aulos, uh, another Aulos we've uh, reconstructed, is the one found in the Louvre in Paris. And uh, this instrument's again made by Robin Howe, uh, this reconstruction, this particular reconstruction, and uh, here's a picture of it. And the instrument's uh, a lot smaller. Um, the first instrument, uh, you heard uh, uh, both of the instruments. Uh, the first two instruments, were what, uh, what the first instrument was uh, uh, reconstructed from uh, both uh, from around the 5th century BC and the, the Louvre Aulos is dated somewhere between maybe 200 BC and uh, uh, the time of Christ although we're not quite sure um, and this one is smaller it has a narrower bore and smaller finger holes and uh, this one uh, it's uh, slightly less pitch flexible and uh, uh, you can play it's much easier to play much uh, more up-tempo pieces on, uh, like you're going to hear now.
Besides the double pipe, there were other pipe instruments. Um, one of the coolest is the hydraulis. So basically they took multiple pipes and put them together and they have a pump or, uh, or something to help to push the air through. So they basically invented an organ and the, called the hydraulis. And oftentimes the pump was run by water, hence the hydro part. Anyways, though, it often played for the gladiator games. So even though I shouldn't, I often think of, you know, like at baseball games where they're going dun, 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 stab, but maybe not to think that way. Um, so besides that, they did actually have a flute type instrument, which in Latin is the tibia obliqua, or in Greek is the plagi alos. It's a single pipe, as flutes are today, and it's often made from lotus wood uh, with a lateral mouthpiece. So it looks a lot like a modern flute and it often had metal bands to allow modulation for it. All right. But the biggest other class of instruments were the stringed lyres. All right. So the Greek term for a lyre is lyra. And basically what it was, was a tortoise shell, because they actually did make their first ones from tortoise shells, a sounding box with strings attached and then two arms that came up to the top and then a crossbar that went between the two arms that the strings attached to. Uh, the standard number of strings in the ancient world is seven, although some rebel lyre players added more. Uh, in Latin, they transliterated the term lyra, but then they also sometimes used testudo, the word for tortoise, because it was made from tortoise shell. And you could also use fidus, which originally just meant the string, but by synecdoche, it comes to mean the whole instrument. And then later on, they just translate the Greek word for tortoise, cellus, also into Latin, and they sometimes use that. The fidiken was the male player of the lyre in Latin, or fidikina was a female player of the lyre. So who played this one? Well, just like with the double pipes, we know that boys and girls and men and women and Apollo, this is his special instrument and the muses, most often Calliope, um, but people from all social classes learned to play the lyre. Again, this was not restricted to just rich people. This is something that, or at least in Rome anyway, uh, in Greece, there were a lot more rich people who played the lyre than poor people, but still, People from all social classes in Rome learned to play the lyre, and we know that they started learning at a young age. So in that uh, Etruscan uh, picture we saw earlier, we could see that the lyre playing kid is even shorter than the double piper, so he's even younger. All right. We know from sepulchral inscriptions too that, again, people were really proud that they could do this. So we have one uh, funeral inscription or tombstone inscription that says to the blessed spirits of Gaius Julius Rhythm, his wife, Julia Lyra made this for her well-deserving husband with whom she lived for 28 years. So we have a couple named Rhythm and Lyre, which I think is just really cool. All right, another guy wrote a whole poem on his wife, Sabbath. And the first thing he tells us about her, that she was learned with the lyre, meaning she was an excellent lyre player. Uh, so that was the first thing he chose to remember about her. And in the stories, it's most commonly Hermes. He's credited with the invention of the lyre. He was born, and on that same day, he stole his brother Apollo's cattle and then figured, hmm, might have a problem if he catches me. But he happened to see a tortoise outside his cave that his cradle was in. So he grabs the tortoise, makes it into the lyre, and then jumps back into his cradle. His brother comes, he's like, you ain't fooling me. I know you took my cattle, pony up. And as recompense for stealing his brother's cattle, young baby Hermes gives him the lyre. And this makes Apollo love him especially. And that's how it ends up being the special instrument of Apollo as well. All right, so besides the, the personal lyre, you have the much bigger version, the kithara, and you notice it's much squarer too, and it has a support strap because it's, again, much larger, but this isn't something that regular people play. This is the professional's instrument. They're kind of expensive. 
uh, in the ancient world. And so Apollo, of course, has one. And because it was so expensive, um, professionals would have to have a certain amount of money coming in to be able to afford their special instruments. And they had contests at the games. At all of the games, except the Olympic games, they actually had kithyroid contests. Kithyroids are the person who play and sing to their playing. And these are by far the most popular musicians of their time. They are the absolute rock stars of it. This is what Emperor Nero wanted to be. Okay, and of course, when he competed, eh, he won, but you got to wonder if he could have lost, uh, given that he was the emperor and could have people killed. But apparently some people really did like his playing because after he committed suicide and there were sightings of Nero somehow, kind of like Elvis, and it was as a Kithero player that they were sighting him. Uh, so it was also the instrument for epic poetry. They even had a special outfit that went with having the special instrument. Now the people who just played, uh, they didn't sing to it themselves. They're called Ketherestes and they're not getting as much love. They're just not getting as much love, but they were still proud of their role. So we see uh, a couple of inscriptions. Uh, this guy, uh, this is his tombstone. His name is Amphion. So he named himself after a famous lyre player from mythology and his brother put up his tombstone for him. That's the one on the left. On the right, and this one's really special, uh, it's for a female professional kithyroida uh, named Oxessus. Um, so it wasn't entirely a male dominated field. This proves that there were female professional musicians. And her husband made this for her after she died, uh, which is very cool. All right. And they had sometimes just called themselves lyre players if they weren't singers. So on the one on the left, we know a girl named Hymnus Gelia. She died at age 18, but she recorded, had recorded was that she was a lyre player, a sultria. That's another term for just lyre player. And this other guy on the right, his name is Pothos. He's a Silo uh, which is a person who plays the lyre but doesn't sing. So it's another term for that. But he also manages to put in there, he's Palmaris. He's an award-winning one. So he doesn't want you to just know that he plays the lyre. He's an award-winning lyre player. Got to get that on your tombstone. All right. But besides the, the lyres, which were by far the most important, uh, along with the tibia, we also had the pan pipes. Um, so they were seven pieces of cane that in... Roman versions were of all different lengths, kind of like making a bird wing shape. They were stopped up with wax and they were also joined with wax and string. And you see them most often with shepherds. It's pretty much shepherds in literature who plays these things. And the picture off to the right is actually a find of a set of pan pipes. Um, the Greek version of this isn't quite the same. All of theirs is uh, the same length and they just stopped them with wax to produce the different tones. But again, they're still played by shepherds. The inventor in the most famous story is Pan, although in some versions it's Hermes, but in the most famous Latin version of it, it's Pan. The story goes that Pan was out one day and he saw this gorgeous nymph named Syrinx. And as often happens in these stories, he wants to get with her, she don't want with him. She runs away from him, she chase, he chases her. She begs her sisters who happen to be river goddesses for help they turn her into reeds. And Pan is all disappointed that the girl he thought he was about to have is a set of reeds. So he sighs in disappointment. <sighs> and well, his breath moving along the reeds, uh, he's like, wow, that's kind of pretty. So he cuts the reeds and then he invents the pan pipes. So there's a lot of that in Latin stories in general. All right. And lastly, there were also professional singers and soloists there. And they were termed either contour or contra case in Latin uh, or monodiarius or monodiaria is another term for that. And again, we know this is something they were very proud of because again, put it on their tombstones. So on the one on the left, all we know is her name was Sopes and she was a singer. On the one on the right, 
Uh, Chrysantha, she's a slave. She died again, very young at only 20. And her fellow slave made this for her. But again, so singing and being a good singer, not restricted to being rich, something that even the poor could do too. So, want to get your own instrument? Well, um, you can get one from several people at, who are on the screen. Uh, for Lars, Lutherios, uh, but for double pipes, there is Robin Howell, the one who made Callum's, and Max Brungberg or Thomas Rosanko and Marco Shiashia. And if you get an instrument and if you want to learn how to play, feel free to contact Callum or Barnaby Brown and to talk about first steps in learning to play the double pipe. All right, so, and finally, one last thing, my, the bibliography for all this, and we thank you for coming to our talk.